a major center of grain trade. It's been called America's breadbasket. A glorious example of a free marketplace. See how it puts bread on your table and tables around the world. Join us on Voices of Vision. Not only is the Midwest the heartland, it's home to the American farmer and the center of the grain trade in the United States. But how do the acres of swaying amber wheat eventually become the breads and cereals that feed millions? The Kansas City Board of Trade links different segments of the industry. This is the pit at the Kansas City Board of Trade, just before the daily trading bell sounds. The pit. A flurry of activity as buyers and sellers meet face to face. To discover the prices of wheat, a pit trader enters into many transactions during the day, rolling with the ups and downs in the market, trying to make a small profit most of the time and end the day with an overall profit. Trades are consummated in the pit. Uh, traders like myself buy and sell contracts for future delivery of wheat. Um, they are not necessarily buyers all the time or sellers all the time. They're doing both at different times. All of the shouting and hand waving is called open outcry and is the cornerstone of many commodities exchanges, including the Kansas City Board of Trade. Open outcry is you stand up and say, I want to buy wheat at this price, and I'm willing to pay, I'm willing to pay this price and th uh, for this quantity. And you yell it sometimes as loud as you can until somebody says sold or take it. While confusing to the layperson, veterans of the pit understand the intricate hand signals that are also a part of open outcry. Hand signals, they're used uh, depending on the... the activity that's going on in the pit, how quick, how quickly things are moving or how quietly things, we do use hand signals. This would be, you're, you're bidding a quarter for wheat. We, the, you don't say the, th the uh, first three numbers, those are a given. The 356, it's already, on, it's already on the board, so everybody knows it's 356, but I'm paying a quarter for it. That means you're paying 356 and a quarter, or I'm paying a half or three quarters. And if your palm is this side, you're buying, and if your palm is this side, you're selling. And this is, a, this is always priced right in, right in here. Quantities are usually on, up here, 10, 20, 30, and that's one, two, three, one, it's one, two, three, six, seven, eight, and so on. 50's up here, those are the numbers that you really worry about, the bigger numbers. <laughs> Greg O'Brien grew up in Kansas City and learned about the Board of Trade when he was in elementary school. The grade school is actually a few blocks from here, and uh, somebody asked me if I'd like to deliver a, a newspaper called the Grain Market Review, and I said well, I didn't know what it was, but sure I'll deliver it. It paid me like I don't know, like ten bucks a day or something. So I rode my bicycle down, and I'd pick up the paper here on the trading floor, and then I'd take it to all the offices in the building, and I did that while I was in grade school cup for a couple of years, and made great money to go you know get a pop or play pinball or something like that, and uh, it, it was it was a lot of fun. I got to meet a lot of people on the floor, and. Uh, and, you know, it's just a real interesting place to be if you're a kid. You're just like, wow. When he was in college at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, he was hired as a pit reporter. A pit reporter will in, in, uh, interpret what all the traders are doing. He will uh, sit, stand, he or she will stand by the pit and listen to the quotes, listen to the, the shouts of the buying and selling, and he will interpret them, speak into a microphone, to somebody that's listening and they will type them up and that's where those quotes come out on the board and go, that go all out over quote machines all over the world. Today, Greg is a pit trader and the first vice chairman of the exchange. My role as a, as a first vice chairman is to uh, help shape ideas and interest of the exchange, help um, run the exchange for lack of a better word. 
Anyone who eats is touched by the Kansas City Board of Trade. The hard red winter wheat that is traded on the exchange is the principal bread wheat raised in the U.S. and exported around the world. We began in 1856 as a place for people to, to meet on the banks of the Missouri River to barter and trade. Jeff Borchert is the president and CEO of the Kansas City Board of Trade. The hard red winter wheat variety that was traded began as uh, turkey red wheat, which was a variety that was brought over long ago. It's the predecessor to our modern varieties of hard red winter wheat, and it was brought into the United States by immigrant farmers who found it uh, particularly suitable to our harsh Midwestern climate. Hard red winter wheat is the predominant wheat grown in the United States, accounting for about 42% of all wheat produced. As well as being the principal bread wheat, it's the primary wheat exported around the world. It's within the venue provided by the Kansas City Board of Trade that its members buy and sell this valuable commodity. Our mission is to provide a fair, efficient, and transparent marketplace for all users of our products. The Board of Trade is a facility for, the, for purposes of managing price risk. Uh, Buyers and sellers come in, and where they meet is called price discovery. Uh, we operate the facility for the benefit of our members and their customers, who include producers, its uh, private co-op and terminal grain elevator operators, merchandisers, uh, exporters, flour mills, uh, food processors, futures commission merchants, brokers, uh, managed funds, and individuals. Remaining constant for 150 years, it's a mission that not only provides for establishing prices, but also channeling information. Not only is the price that's discovered based on supply and demand, uh, what we call transparency, but also the information flow that's exchanged on the trading floor and gets passed along to the customers and to the end users and all the market participants. So it's not just the price that's being discovered, but it's the whole wealth of knowledge and information flow that's exchanged on the trading floor to make sure that the marketplace is fair and equitable for all market participants. It's June, and farmers across the Midwest are harvesting hard red winter wheat. The process begins with the fields, the plants, and the dedicated people who nurture them. Well, somebody's still going to have to feed this country, and I feel like it's coming from America because we're so innovative and so much of an entrepreneur that we're going to be the ones that think of how to do it and get the job done. And, and uh, when we started this great country some 200 years ago, anybody that could work real hard, you know, seemed like they'd done well on a farm. But that isn't the case today. It's the guys that can push the pencil and do the figuring, let all that's supposed to be done. It's, it's just transferred from uh, hard labor to technical farming. Larry and Barbara Crable have spent most of their 52 years of married life as Kansas farmers. They love the life and believe their work is important. I grew up on the farm and, and I remember the wonderful days of farming and I guess I still have it in my mind. So I would have uh, inherited part of the family farm back in central Kansas and I had family that wanted to buy it so I sold it and I bought this piece of ground that's right at our background. And it's, it's been good for us. Uh, farming has, you have to watch it, you watch your investment costs, but it's been good for us or we wouldn't keep hanging on to it and buying a little bit of additional land. With 52 harvests behind him, Daryl Brem is representative of today's small independent family farmer. My son farms with me and works for me. And then I have two full-time men on top of that. And we farm between five and 6,000 acres. Uh, we have about 1,300 acres of irrigated crop. And we raise wheat, milo, and corn, and lots of corn. And uh, the, uh, also have a cow herd of about 135 cows, which are running the grass pastures in the summer. He's seen plenty of change over the decades. Well, the biggest change, I had old John Deere D tractors and that type of thing, and now we got these 375, 400 horsepower tractors with, you know, uh, guidance systems. We just put a guidance system in the new tractor this year, with, and uh, they can go out and drive around and tell you how many acres GPS. The other day, they were bragging on what the elevation of the ground was from sea level, and I asked him, how did that? 
pan in. I'm sure he's got figured out how. I've turned that type thing over to my son. He's 40-some years old. The book's about an inch thick, and I don't want to learn that much. Growing and harvesting are the initial steps in the journey. But from there, the wheat must be processed and transformed into a usable commodity. That mill behind us, they're processing wheat into flour. Um, Mike Dean is the regional merchandising manager for Horizon Milling. One of the key objectives is to have a consistent source of wheat throughout the year. So every year at harvest, we do a survey and go out in the general area of that mill, survey the crop, determine the analytical properties of the crop, and Mother Nature changes it every year on us, so we have to, to be on our toes. Um, when we determine good, consistent sources, it is delivered into the mill. Uh, at that point, the mill itself has an elevator inside of it in which their key responsibilities is to blend by protein and by analytical properties and uh, deliver that stock to the mill. In the mill, the wheat is tempered and ground into flour. At that point, it's either loaded onto trucks uh, or rail cars for shipment to uh, uh, warehouses or to end users such as bakeries. Um, in many cases, the packaging can be in five and 10 pound bags or it can be loaded out in bulk as well. We have two companies uh, whose number one raw material is wheat flour. John Stout is the chairman and CEO of Plaza Belmont Management Group, a private equity fund specializing in purchasing and operating food manufacturing companies. And the flour then is loaded onto bulk trucks and it's shipped to our tortilla factories where we unload the bulk trucks pneumatically into large bulk silos. Uh, from that point, the flour is pulled from the bins and mixed with other minor ingredients, water and oil, into a large dough mixer. They make a dough just like you use to make bread or a number of other products. And then that 400 pound dough is loaded into a divider which creates a small dough ball which then goes into a proofer. From the proofer it goes to the oven, from the oven to the cooler, and from the cooler to packaging. The Kansas City Board of Trade gives customers, such as John Stout, the capacity to lock in their ingredient costs. One of the things that the Board of Trade allows us to do with the use of purchasing and selling wheat futures contracts and or using puts and calls, which are options on those futures contracts, it enables us to fix the raw material costs of wheat flour for prolonged periods of time and therefore give our customers the price stability that they need to operate their business. For the consumer, that translates into hard currency. One Kansas City Board of Trade hard red winter wheat futures or options contract represents 5,000 bushels of wheat. This year, the December 2004 wheat futures contract has had a range from a low of about 317 a bushel, that's three dollars and seventeen cents, to four dollars and forty-four cents on the high side. And that dollar and twenty-seven cents per bushel, although it sounds insignificant, represents a significant amount of money. If you were to take that price fluctuation from the low to the high, it represents about 1.1 billion dollars a year in the U.S. on flour consumption. It represents four hundred dollars per year for every man, woman, and child. So a family of four, that'd be $1,600 from the low side to the high side. I doubt they would want that kind of fluctuation in their bread prices or their tortilla prices or cakes, cookies, crackers, etc. The Kansas City Board of Trade will always be an integral part of these companies that I mentioned because without them, we can't give the price stability to our customer that they need. To calculate or to understand how we grind or why we grind, we need to look at the effect of the tip speed. Well, we're an institute that's dedicated to the marketing of four crops, wheat, corn, soybeans, and sorghum. And the idea is to export these overseas. And so we assist in uh, buyers of those commodities and helping them learn about those commodities so they can buy and be happier with their purchase so they won't make any mistakes. John Howard is the director of the International Grains Program at Kansas State University. It's a program engineered to educate foreign business leaders and government officials about U.S. grains and oil seeds through technical training and assistance programs in storage and handling, milling, marketing, and processing. 
One of the partners is the U.S. Grain Council. They identify the potential buyers or customers of U.S. wheat, and they'll send them to a short course here at Kansas State University so that they can learn how wheat is graded on our grading system, how it's uh, sold, how they can understand price discovery like the Kansas City Board of Trade. For example, every day of the world, uh, you can find out the price of wheat. And it's no secret, it's very transparent. And we show them how they can find out what their commodity will cost. And we show them how they can get it shipped to, them, to themselves. And uh, the main thing is uh, decrease their risk when they buy it, because there is risk in buying uh, commodities. These participants come from all over the world so that they can better understand the U.S. commodities industry. Usually the people that come to our short courses work for a company that buys raw material, corn, wheat, sorghum, or uh, soybeans, and processes that into a product for their particular market. Primarily it will be a flour miller or his accountant, for example. Uh, the accountant of uh, one of the mills in South America came. He didn't know anything about wheat. But the reason his boss sent him here is because he needed to know the value of the germ, the value of the brand, the value of the endosperm, and then also the other byproducts because he's doing the accounting. He needed to understand shrink because you buy X and amount of pounds of, uh, of raw material today, but when you get it at your port, it might be less. And so he has to understand shrink because he sat there and said, no, we had X number of tons and now it's less. What happened to it? You know, somebody lost it. So we've got the processor of the raw material, uh, the related industries. We'll have bakers come that don't do flour milling but want to understand the flour milling process better. Field trips, including the exchange and even a reception with Kansas City Board of Trade members, are an important part of that course. We want them to see, one, a farm. Uh, the time of year that we have particular courses, we have them to coincide, for example, in April of each year, we have our grain purchasing course because the wheat is up, it's pretty, at this latitude, and uh, so we'll take them to a farm, and we'll take them to an elevator, and we'll take them to the Kansas City Board of Trade where they can see the price being discovered. Usually at the Board of Trade, uh, not usually, every short course we take to the board, Kansas City Board of Trade so they can see that price being discovered. Perhaps the most important lesson learned is that transparency is key to the industry. Transparent market is something that uh, uh, anybody can see what the price is. It's not a secret like you and I aren't over in a corner making a deal. And it's highly regulated at these, uh, in, in the futures markets both by the government and by themselves. And the idea is we want to know what that price is. Everybody knows what the price is. It's this price transparency that fuels the prolific U.S. export market. Nearly 50% of all wheat that's produced in the United States uh, goes for export. According to the U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture, the, the United States is the leading exporter of wheat around the world accounting for roughly 25 percent of total world wheat exports. Mike Mandel is operations manager for Lewis Dreyfus Corporation, a major U.S. exporter of hard red winter wheat. Like so many involved with the Board of Trade, his interest began as a student. Actually, I've been in, involved with the Kansas City Board of Trade for uh, a long time. When I was in high school, I had a good friend of mine whose father was the, was the pit reporter up on the trading floor. And at that time, summers were busy because of wheat harvest, and so they needed help. Um, they needed people helping mark prices on the, the, the chalkboards at that time. And so uh, I got the opportunity to, to do that a, a few summers, and I continued that through college. I, I went to college here in Kansas City. And so uh, got involved in the industry uh, in, in that capacity. And then when I graduated from college, uh, it, it interest, interested me to the point to where uh, th that's what I wanted to continue. The Kansas City Board of Trade and its services are critical to the success of exporters like Lewis Dreyfus Corporation. The process provides the, the exporter the, the opportunity to 
manage uh, price risk associated with uh, the uh, purchase of, of wheat in the country uh, and the eventual export of that product to various countries around the world. Not only does the Board of Trade encourage exports by providing the engine for stabilizing prices, but through the system's transparency, it helps maintain lower prices to the consumer. It's a marketplace that allows all users of the product to, to be involved. And when that happens, that's, uh, that promotes competition. And that competition, uh, I think, uh, allows for a much more representative pricing me mechanism. A cornerstone of the Board of Trade's success is that it understands market integrity is crucial to its viability. Traders are the subject of constant scrutiny by exchange compliance staff who aggressively police the floor traders regarding compliance with exchange rules and regulations. Additionally, the CFTC, or Commodities Futures Trading Commission, is the federal government agency regulating the industry. It watches to ensure the exchange carries out its regulatory efforts in a fair and equitable manner. Jeff Borchard began his career at the Board of Trade as a commodities investigator. A commodities investigator is part of the compliance department. They're like the internal police force. They're the ones that make sure that all of the trading that's being conducted down on the trading floor is in accordance with our rules and also the government regulations. While the federal government establishes the regulations, the rules are determined by the exchange itself. The rules for the exchange are established by the members themselves, by the directors, and so uh, the, we're also a self-regulatory organization, which means that we enforce our own rules under the, uh, the watchful eye of our government regulators, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. With the global economy in a constant state of flux, the Kansas City Board of Trade continues to evolve to meet these changing needs. With some circles considering electronic trading the wave of the future, the Board of Trade is already preparing to incorporate the new technology. We've positioned ourselves uh, such to be competitive in the future. You know, while we, we know that open outcry for ag products is, is the best environment, uh, we don't know what the future holds. So we've positioned ourselves by securing the most suitable electronic trading platform for the benefit of our market users which has tremendous uh, distribution and unequaled functionality, we've positioned ourselves to offer that overnight for our flagship weed and weed options products and also, as I said, to put our value line stock index contract on an electronic trading system. Uh, if in the future demand is such that it requires electronic trading uh, of, of our flagship products during the day, we're certainly in a position to be able to offer that. Scott Smith is chairman of the board of the Kansas City Board of Trade, as well as the manager for a major futures commission merchant, or FCM, which is just another term for a commodities broker. Well, I think uh, for the Kansas City Board of Trade and, and the future in, in, in general, certainly uh, we're going to have to continue to be uh, uh, looking, uh, looking at the, the various uh, ways competition is, is changing our business. Uh, uh, I think uh, electronic trading is certainly going to uh, affect not only the FCMs but the exchanges. It's going to change the way that we do business and it's something that uh, both sides of the business are going to need to embrace. Uh, we need to figure out a way to make sure that uh, uh, when we're using this new technology that we're helping not only exchanges do things more efficiently, but also that it uh, helps uh, our customers in the long run get the, uh, get the product and, and get the execution uh, that, they, that they need uh, to do when they're investing in these types of instruments. While the Kansas City Board of Trade looks into the new electronic trading systems and the applicability of these systems for its business, it will continue to lead the industry by promoting methods beneficial to the success of grain trade and to the people who make it happen. For more information about Voices of Vision or the organization profile, visit our website at www.voicesofvision.org.